We are uh, going to talk about uh, LNG issues, uh, international issues. And um, please, uh, uh, let's start from the international uh, outlook about LNG. What is the vision about LNG market and the evolution of LNG market at an international level from the U.S. point of view? So there are currently the three markets, as you know, the Atlantic Pacific. Um, the LNG U.S. was looking to be an importer five years ago. We have these enormous shale gas resources, and the projections are that with this extra gas, even with our local demand, we will be a net exporter by 2020. How do you think uh, shale gas revolution in the USA could uh, change uh, USA energy, uh, um, energy policy? On a domestic level, it's already happening. We're replacing coal with natural gas. Um, the shale gas uh, was 5% of domestic production 10 years ago. It's now 37% and growing. Uh, there's no geologic risk because we know where it is. And once we get the technology down, there's other places in the world that have shale gas as well because it's a source rock. It's actually interesting the way this revolution started was with the independent, the smaller companies, not the bigger companies. Um, the smaller companies and the service companies that do work for everyone, they transfer the technology. When you look at Exxon and Rosneft or American companies with the Chinese, there's no question that there's certain technology and application of technology will be transferred as they develop those resources. The important point is that all shales are different. So what you do in one formation doesn't necessarily mean success in another. So we're learning all the time. Coming to fuel competition, uh, do you think that uh, LNG will uh, compete with oil-based products for transportation, maritime and land transportation? So uh, marine transportation, clearly. Uh, the fact that we used LNG tankers that were running on diesel was just silly. They should have been running on LNG. They're carrying LNG. Um, so marine transport, I think that happens pretty quickly. Uh, that changes refinery configuration because you don't need bunker fuel anymore. For ground transportation, uh, natural gas in the United States works better with um, buses that have big gas tanks, big gas tanks surrounded by steel and protected. And for small fleets that get central refueling, uh, taxi cabs, uh, delivery vehicles that go back to one place at night and get refueled, doesn't work so well for our passenger vehicles because of the distances we drive. The difference is when you compare diesel or gasoline, the reason we use so much of them is that it's concentrated energy because it has more carbons. So you need to repressurize the gas to be able to use it to have the mileage that you need. So our, our gasoline, we get 60 miles to the gallon for some of the better cars. So it'll be hard for gas to do that without constant refueling or battery backup. Coming to the um, liquefaction plants uh, authorization in the U.S., uh, uh, can you um, advise something about uh, the authorization fees of your projects uh, in the U.S.? Will U.S. Uh, become an, an exporter of LNG to Europe and other markets? So the, the projections on volume is that we will become an exporter. We will have more supply than the local demand. There are 19 applications for export. There's one that's been approved so far, um, and that's to free trade countries because that's the way our laws work. If you're building a new regasification plant or liquefaction plant in the United States, it's now $10 billion. And then you have to add... Uh, pipelines, storage facilities, and port facilities. So those um, ports now that already have the other three but have a regas facility for them to convert to liquefaction, it's a smaller price. Those are the projects that are likely to go forward. And then the question is, when you compare the U.S. price with the world price, either Europe or Asia, there's opportunities. But um, when you look at transportation, and, and liquefaction and regas on the other side, that, that differential changes. So depending on the price of gas and the price of LNG in the, in the forward market, there may be fewer exports than you think. The European Union is talking about uh, um, LNG for shipping and LNG for trucks, as in uh, the U.S. Uh, from your point of view, um, what is the outlook for European Union uh, about uh, LNG? So if Europe needs to do four or five things, one is do pipeline interconnects so that you can move it around internally. The second is on the rate structure, determine what prices and incentives people need to make those investments. 
build liquefaction facilities to bring it in and then couple renewables with natural gas because that's the balancer, right? So that works really well and then storage facilities. But if Europe does those things and efficiency, they should be in good shape. Today, do you think that uh, energy independence is uh, still um, a dream or uh, it will become a reality in the next uh, 10 years for so you guys? I think people misinterpret what independence means. It's a, it's a political holy grail. We've looked for that for 40 years. And now we're on the cusp of having more supply and reduced demand. So we're in, we're in, we don't like to use independence. We talk about enhancing our security, but we're in an interdependent world. And we think that global trade is a good thing. And so we'll probably continue to uh, export refined products. We're looking to export LNG, but we're also looking to import as well.